Welcome to 10 Ideas 50 Years. This is video number 10. I'm Jeff Cliff, and I'm trying to get across in this video series 10 ideas that you should know. Uh, in particular, uh, this is the last video of the series, so if you haven't seen any of the other videos, you may want to go check them out, because this is going to build on some of those ideas and some of the uh, concepts uh, that those 10 videos have tried to get across. So, uh, what are we talking about today? As I kind of alluded to uh, in the last video, uh, we're going to be talking about NORAD today, and in particular, uh, a paper on NORAD called Man as Transducer of Probabilities in Command and Control Systems by Ward Edwards and L.B. Phillips. This is in a uh, book uh, titled Human Judgment and Optimality, uh, which was published in 1964 uh, and was trying to kind of wrap uh, the, it, it was a multi, uh, multi-discipline, uh, I guess a very broad view of what human judgment uh, and intelligence could do and what it was capable of doing and from the perspective of 1964, up until about that point, uh, the assumption was that the both theoretical systems and computer systems at the time that were implementing the ideas in these theoretical systems uh, tended to, to operate with the assumption that uh, they weren't very intelligent or that you could, you could grasp a concept perhaps but you wouldn't be able to do what a human mind would be able to do and you wouldn't be able to certainly compete with a human mind and it was kind of absurd from the beginning the idea that a computer or, or a theoretical system could act upon information in an intelligent manner, could judge correctly uh, as good or just as good as a human being could. And so this book tried to flip that situation around where it asked the question, if you had a system that was as smart as a human being or was perfectly uh, or suitable to judgment, as, uh, uh, i.e. if it was capable of judgment and was perfect at that particular task, what would be its properties, and what would we be able to know about such a system, and what could we know about some system, or some, or what, what can we know about judgment itself that we can then use in, in our day-to-day -day life and build systems around, and that, that was kind of the direction that they were going. In this paper specifically, uh, kind of brought that question to a practical uh, I guess end, uh, which we're going to see in a minute. But before I get too far deep into it, I, I just want to define a couple of things. Uh, the first is, what is a transducer? Uh, so engineers in the crowd uh, might you know, be well aware of what a transducer is, which is basically a device or uh, a substance, and this is from Wikipedia, uh, such as a piezoelectric crystal, a microphone, or a uh, or, or perhaps a, an electric cell that converts one kind of energy into another output kind of energy. So you have an input energy in one form, an output energy in another. Maybe you have chemical energy coming in, an electric energy coming out, or something of that sort. And so it's going to try to, to use this as a metaphor to describe certain kinds of information or certain kind of useful knowledge that it, this system that they're going to be trying to build or discuss uh, is going to be drawing from one kind of information and giving another kind of information in a certain way. And we'll see how that works in a bit. Uh, but another quote that uh, might be worth pointing out here uh, is by Francis, or Francis Bacon, uh, quote, it would be an unsound fancy and self-contradictory to expect that the things which have never yet been done can be done except by means which have never yet been tried. So that's the, the kind of context of what is going on here. Uh, and that w there was a, a, a kind of flipping of perspectives in 1964 where they were trying to do uh, things that required intelligence or, or at least required uh, a lot of careful thought, uh, which looked at the time to be very difficult. Uh, and in particular, uh, there is the question of how to deal with the Cold War. And the, the Soviets uh, were at the 
that time, it was very close to the, the Bay of Pigs invasion, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the, these are, you know, very, very tense times. They, they have a lot of resources in the United States and in the West in general uh, being spent trying to figure out how the Soviets are going to react, whether a nuclear war was going to start, and if a nuclear war did start, uh, how, you know, being able to detect that that was going on before it was too late, uh, or at least soon enough that a credible uh, return volley of nuclear missiles could be, or, or nuclear bombers, or whatever the, the deployment mechanism was at the time, uh, that a, a, a reaction could be made in, in a short enough time that it, it would be a credible threat to the Soviets to keep them from actually making their first move. And so uh, there, there was a, a lot of kind of thought and effort being put into this. Now, uh, it should also be noticed, uh, again, before we get too deep into this, that we're, we may have the advantage of 50 years of notation guiding us. So some of the uh, kind of expressions you know, we'll be writing down might not be exactly the same as the ones in the original book, uh, but that's because, again, we, we, we don't have to use their really poor uh, notation. We, we can use our own. So uh, their, their goal is going to give a walkthrough of a, the, the system that they wanted uh, to be built in NORAD. Of course, we don't have access to NORAD at this very moment, so we can't you know, go and look to see if it's still there. Uh, but you can, you can assume that uh, they're not going to be too far from the truth. Th this is a technical uh, kind of explanation of how things should work by people who were hired to come up with a design to, and to, to design how things should work at the time. So if, if you go back to, for example, the movie War Games, you, know, you, you can see that they were in fact investing in, in computer technology at the time. They were in the process of trying to make uh, a system that would kind of look at all the information that was going on at the time and to kind of act on that or at least give the human beings in that situation uh, a, a, a view or a, a control of the situation. So the kind of core idea of what they were trying to do uh, was to separate out and, and why, why they frame it in this, this way. Uh, was to separate out two things. Things that human beings should do uh, in the context of a system at NORAD, a system that was watching the, the Soviet Union, and it's assumed that on the other side the Soviets could very well be developing something along these lines, but a, a system to, to, to help them deal with the Cold War, to help them deal with the threat of a nuclear attack. And so th this is a very critical system to the, the s safety and security of the United States. So it has to be done right. It, it has to be basically done as perfect as possible uh, because the alternative, the, the, the system failing is in effect nuclear war and the destruction of practically the entire United States, possibly most life on Earth as we know it or knew it at the time. And so they wanted to separate out the things that a computer should do and the things that human beings should do. Because at the time there was assumptions that human beings were the, you know, the source of intelligence, the, 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 the authority that a computer system should look up to in many respects. But they were starting to see little bits and pieces and little clues that computers could help with the task of managing the mountain of information that they were starting to get in. And so they, they the, the core idea here is that the split that they were proposing was that the human beings should be concerned with the conditional data and the conditional probabilities, and the computers should be concerned with the non-conditional probabilities. Now, people who have seen the last video may remember, and one of the previous ones perhaps, want, may kind of understand where this is going to go. Uh, but the, the idea would be to transduce, to change from one set of probabilities or one set of information about the global state to another. So just as some review,
we want the probability of each given d by Bayes' law, or Bayes' rule. Uh, we, we need to find the probability of d given h, we need to find the probability of h, and we need to find the probability of d. And if our goal in this case is the probability of h given d, i.e. the h is almost entirely in this context going to be are the Russians attacking? Are the Russians sending nuclear bombs our way? And so if we want to find the probability of are the Russians attacking given d for some data, we need to find the probability that they're attacking, the probability of that data, and the probability of that data given that they're attacking. There may be other H's in this case, uh, but they're mostly going to be concerned uh, with other aspects of what we know, uh, with the end goal of finding of whether the attack is being made. But as you could imagine, if, if, you, if there's anything else that you don't know, where a, a line or a chain of reasoning can lead to the thing that you do want to know, uh, you'll also want to calculate it by this means. So, uh, just to kind of give a, a view at a glance, uh, it was viewed by NORAD that this question of whether the missiles have been fired is the most important decision of that time, period. Full stop. This is not a, you know, they, they, they you know, may not have formalized it, but from at least their perspective, um, this kind of trumped all other research problems. And so this, this is going to be uh, something that is extremely important to get right. Uh, failure was you know, is, is not an option as humanly possible in this context. Another point is that by about 1963, there were computers, and there was a lot of electronic equipment that was monitoring a lot of different things. Uh, the United States was monitoring weather and weather patterns, uh, and the monitoring of weather and we weather patterns using electronic instruments hooked up especially hooked up to computers to, to sift through the data, was still something that was fairly new. Uh, the you know, position of various, perhaps military hardware, uh, geographical information, uh, there was all sorts of data that was still, or that was being collected that had not really been collected before, or at least if it was collected before, it was not collected in such a great magnitude and in such an organized way. And so by 1964, there, there was a question of how do you deal with this information? And this also included both uh, what we would call fuzzy and, I guess, non-fuzzy uh, qu quantities and qualities. So this is going to include everything from the, the very easy to measure, for example, you know, temperature. What is the temperature at this location to uh, perhaps more, you know, broadly and hazily defined things like, you know, what are the Soviets feeling like today? Or what is the, the, the you know, the, the, the leader of the, the Soviet Union, you know, is he having a good day today? And so you, these were questions that could be asked. These were questions that computers could c have an answer for, even if they weren't perfect. Uh, but these are the, the types of things that you could conceivably have a system that monitors and have uh, a system that then feeds to someone who is making a decision on either, you know, do you go to war today, uh, or, or other questions too, of, you know, how much pressure do we put on the, the Soviets? How, how much, you know, do we work with our allies and, and to what extent can we rely on them, etc. And so you could see very quickly that you wouldn't want, for example, the President of the United States to have the entirety of all the information collected at hand, because that's too much information. You have to have some method, either human beings or computers, to sort through it, to, to allow you to make intelligent conclusions from it. And so the, the approach that was mostly used at the time was that you get the best data that you can get, the data that you can uh, rely on. And the, the data that, for example, you could use in a, a legal case, 
you know, if, if you took pictures of Soviet missiles in Cuba and you took them to the United Nations, you would want the, the data to be convincing and, and to the point where there wasn't really uncertainty left in it that a reasonable person could point to, that there at least would be reason to believe that it is as true as possible. And so that was kind of the approach at a general level in the, the U.S. military and the U.S. government in general. Uh, there may be exceptions, but that is specifically when dealing with the building of computer systems at the time, uh, how a lot of their approaches were, were kind of pointed. And so the, the idea that if there was uncertainty within the data, that you, you should basically throw it out. You know, computers at the time were not very uh, robust. They broke down. They had errors both in hardware and in software. High-level languages weren't really invented yet. There was Lisp and COBOL and FORTRAN, but even then they were primitive, more or less primitive versions of the three. Uh, there may have been other examples, but this is an, an, uh, an age when getting things to compute right was a hard thing. It usually involved multiple experts, uh, that, you know, very highly trained, especially women, uh, involved trying to make, kind of coax the machine to get the right answer uh, in spite of all the trouble that they had in the mechanical levels, etc. And so the, there was a, a large practice in, in the scientific and you know, government and military community of if there was data that was in any reason suspect, that you would throw it out and either recalculate it or go back to the field and regather it. And that there was, you know, th this was just how you would deal with bad data. In particular, uh, although not in this uh, particular paper, uh, elsewhere in the book, uh, there was, and on page 45, if you actually have a copy, uh, there was a discussion about, or in a, I guess, chapter deliberation and judgment, uh, that made the point that if it made, or if some data made its way into the database in question, or into, you know, for example, NORAD's database, it was assumed to be true. And so you had databases at the time. Databases were a thing. Uh, and they were assumed to be filled with good data. Now, anyone who's ever dealt with a database, a really, really large database uh, in modern times, would probably know that either by upgrades or by uh, um, just the normal operation of the system, sometimes bad data finds its way into your database. Uh, you end up with fields that have nulls in them, for example. This is the sort of thing that you are going to be watching a lot for in modern days. Uh, and there is, to some extent, uh, some of this kind of behavior of, you know, if it's in the database, it's true. That, that, that is kind of kept with us to some extent, although it isn't quite as common as perhaps it may have been in the 60s. But, so, so you know, to, to give this frame, you know, you have a computer, it's very fallible, you have a database, that is conceivably as fallible as the computer, but you assume that if it's operating correctly, if the data made its way into that database, that it's true. Okay. And again, so they had a lot of data. They had warehouses full of data. They had punch cards in rooms filled with punch cards that they could feed into computers using skilled staff to feed these pieces of paper into computers. Uh, you know, you, you, I, I, I don't know the, the magnitude, maybe a gigabyte of punch cards. It is a lot of punch cards, but th this is the, the kind of magnitude that we're talking here. We're, we're talking pre or pushing the limits of organizations and how much data they could handle. This was something that was going on at the time. And so there was a lot of really low quality, high error laden uh, data, and most of it was garbage. Uh, there was a, a kind of going off on a tangent, uh, a, a book, a database in a Free Society, I believe, where one of the things pointed out there, uh, either that or the National Academy of Sciences uh, book on computers and technology in the 70s, one of the two, uh, would, would point out that uh, there was in the, the legal system uh, a lot of uh, what we would, as of the early 2000s and late 90s consider to be fairly invasive um, you know, surveillance into people's lives, 
but one thing that kind of kept the systems in that context from being very harmful was that most of the data was not accurate. And this is not specific to the legal system and the police system computers at the time. Uh, there, were, there were computers, but the, if, uh, the, there was a lot of garbage coming in. So garbage in, gar garbage out. And especially when you're dealing with mountains of paper, uh, you are going to have trouble with the accuracy of your data as that paper degrades. And so a lot of approaches would take the approach of if the data, you know, if this mountain of you know, paper cards was not 100% valid, you couldn't use any of it. You would throw the whole thing out, waste a whole bunch of paper in the process, but also the data that that paper contained, even if there was some good data in it. You just had to throw it out. And worse than just throwing out a mountain of data and a mountain of information that you had spent a lot of time and effort and money collecting, is you have to go back out into the field and collect it again. You know, if you wanted to collect weather data and store it for five years, you may be storing it on a magnetic tape, you may not be storing it on a magnetic tape, you may be storing it on paper. Uh, in either case, both are very valuable technologies at the time, and so you would have to, you know, first spend a whole bunch of money to, you know, collect this data, you would have to, you know, go through and verify that it was it's still good after a couple of years of you know sitting on the sidelines collecting dust and then when you found some bit rot you would throw it all out and then recollect some you know relevant data maybe not weather data I, you, you know you're, you're you're imagining stuff like the uh, mechanical uh, preparedness of the, the Soviet Union and their you know particular industrial uh, capability at any given location which again is also going to change with time. So, you know, just throwing more uh, problems into, you know, how do you keep a system consistent with what the, the world is actually, you know, constructed? And so, the the question of how do you deal with one information that two is either bad or three uh, gets outdated was was a real problem. And so they were looking at ways of of dealing with this problem uh, for the the mountains of data and the quantity of da data that they had. But kind of a, another kind of question to give a frame of this is if you had a vial of some chemical that you're doing a test on uh, and you have a, a, and this was actually given to me in a job interview at a research uh, institution that I worked at where they, they if you, uh, you know, have a, a set of vials that you're, you're doing some experiment on and you notice that two of the, the vials in the middle are mislabeled, what do you do with the entire set of vials? And the correct answer up until the 60s was you throw the whole thing out because the experiment has gone bad. And due to some error, uh, you basically destroyed your entire data set. Uh, there, you could, you know, if you are in control enough of the experiment, maybe, you know, do analysis without those two particular data points. But at the, at, at the point where your data is mislabeled, you have screwed up your data and it is assumed bad. So that was the approach up until this paper. And so the first step away from this kind of data waste, this kind of you know, mountain of recollecting data over and over again, is what they called a probabilistic program. And that is basically what, you know, as it's described, a program that deals not necessarily in certainties, but in probabilities. And so by the 1960s, there were experimental designs of systems that would not necessarily store the, 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 you know, the truth of the data, or, but would assign to each data point, uh, you know, maybe elevation data in a particular region or you know, manufacturing capability or some economic variable, that you know, these, these data points would have associated with them some probability of being true. And then the system would then choose, if forced to come up with a, an answer that wasn't probabilistic, would use the probabilities, come up with a random number, and then choose some outcome that would approximate you know, reality, basically. That would come up with randomly generated data where the, the randomness is constrained by the aspects of the system in question. And then this 
this sort of system would have the, 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 the feature of being able to use in some situations where a crisp system uh, in, in modern parlance would not be able to be used. So if, if you need uh, to feed into NORAD, you know, the question of is you know, the leader of the Soviet Union having a good day, this is not something that you're going to be able to know with certainty by default, but you may be able to have a system that at least gives an answer of that. Yes, he's having a good day. No, he's not having a good day. You know, yes, he has a mistress. No, he doesn't have a mistress. These sorts of questions. You could have an answer, even if it's not necessarily fully accurate. But there's a problem with these systems in that, uh, well, to start with, you, you end up getting systems where you have a lot of probabilities and you're describing a lot of things with probabilities. But how do you use that information? And how do you t go from that to action and systems that are able to um, guide judgment and guide your understanding of other things? And so it wasn't really clear by 1964 exactly how you could do that. Now, people who have watched the previous video may kind of know where this is going because there is a way to guide action and to guide further investigation based upon if you have a set of probabilities that are as accurate as you, you, the system manager, or you, the person who is in, in charge of this computer system, can find. And that is, of course, Bayes' theorem and Bayes' Bayesian inference. And so they, they put two and two together uh, in this, I guess, context to basically use uh, Bayesian inference to constrain what their estimates were for particular uh, questions and particular data points that they had these particular inputs for. And so from that, you can then build bigger and bigger views, coherent, bigger and bigger pictures, opinions that are consistent across larger and larger domains. And that in particular, because this is the best that you can do with information, at least these three pieces of information, the pictures that they were starting to generate were at least thought to be the best data that you could come up with, given limited information on the lower levels. So it was the best big picture they could come up with, given their constraint of language in expressing it, their ability to uh, come up with these priors, i.e., and this is actually something I think I, I failed to fully describe in the last video. A prior is a probability P of D or P of H. It is the belief you hold before doing inference on a particular subject matter. The, 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 probability, the subjective probability that you hold prior to applying some new conditional you know, ratio or, or conditional belief on given new information, given an um, inference. So, you know, they, they had these priors and they, they needed to know what to do with it. Now they knew what to do with it. And so the, they found uh, that when they used Bayesian inference with probabilistic computer systems, or, or at least probabilistic systems, that they started to do better than their discrete systems were capable of doing, which makes some sense if you think about it. If you're throwing out all of your good data, if a little bit of that data is bad, uh, and the probabilistic system uh, is, you know, has the good data and the bad data, and has a knowledge of how good their good data is and how bad their bad data is, then the, you know, that system is going to be able to, with less input, predict the same kinds of things that the good system is able to predict uh, more often, or, or at least in, in, you know, it's going to be up more often. It's going to be not waiting for data. It's going to be ready to provide the user with guidance more often. Uh, and that, in this case, is going to count. So, 
kind of looking again. So for two separate distributions, um, a, a posterior distribution or a, a resulting distribution expressing some knowledge is going to be defined, as, as mentioned in the previous video, by the prior distribution multiplied by the conditional distribution in the same manner as if those distributions were merely prior probabilities themselves. So they you know, expressed these two uh, given this relationship. So this is, again, you know, if you don't have u of x, you can derive it by this integral, given the two distributions. So it's just another example of, you know, if, if you have two pieces of data, you can probably generate the third, given the constraint that you're dealing with two per, or merging the information in two separate distributions. And so this relationship is something that is possible to, do, you know, to code. You, you could write a function in assembly language that would do this. And from that, you would get the probability of you know, y, some data point y, given some data point x. And similarly to you know, the using this for, for some particular probability, but again, you know, these are possibly you know, fuzzy distributions, possibly uh, continuous, possibly not. But the relationship is still going to hold between you know, the, the probability of x the uh, probability of y given x and the probability of y uh, for, the, for that particular case. And so in practice, what, what is this going to look like? So the u of y, this thing, is going to be the, the prior probability of y, the prior density, the probability density function of y, the second function worth pointing out is this v of x of y, which is the density of x given the prior probability density of y. And then y of x is the density of x. On some domain. And so, kind of viewing things in this light, the question is going to be for the authors, what part are the computers going to do and what part are the humans going to do? And it's kind of pointed out, the, the human beings are going to do the conditional probability part. They are going to fill in these these tables of defining these functions. They're going to define these functions. They're going to define this probability for the system. They're going to ignore the density of the data points specifically that they're looking for. And so 
you know, there, there may be cases where the human beings will actually go out into the field and collect data, but that's going to be separate from the actual processing of data later on in this system. And the computers are going to take care of the busy work of managing these functions, where the humans are going to be specifically focused on the conditional. Now, by this point, uh, they were beginning to be aware that there were problems with the use of human beings and computers together, in that they didn't have the, the idea of a, a user interface or user experience problem, but they were certainly working their way towards viewing things in that light. And so they needed to be able to use the computer, they needed to be able to stick human beings in front of the computer screen and to allow them to input the probability of the given age, to be able to input this distribution between these two data points y and x. And so the, the choice of a, the best display for a particular hypothesis and implicitly how reliable each uh, display is for each particular kind of data that they were dealing with was at the time an active research problem. But it was one that they could, again, deal with in terms of Bayes' rule. So this is something that if they had an estimation of how accurate their estimations were as human beings, you know, the, the correcting factor could be applied to any recommendations, uh, any conditional probability that the human beings would put into the system. Another uh, problem that they found uh, when trying to design this system is that their estimators, i.e. the human beings who would put into the computer system the conditional probabilities, uh, if they were able to see the output of any particular uh, data applied with uh, the an evasion in principle or otherwise, uh, then what would happen was they would have a opinion or a, a feedback loop would be created where they would plug into the system this. They would see this and based on this they would change their conditional probability estimation, which was a problem because their changing it was not based on Bayesian inference. They're changing it with based on subjective inference, based on how they felt. Uh, so, the it was a problem that was noticed early on that you had to cut this feedback loop, and that the people who were involved with estimating this conditional probability could not see the output of their particular uh, information because it would po it would poison their ability to uh, carefully come up with this conditional information. So their, their, their first recommendation in building this beyond use of Bayesian inference was to not let human beings who were dealing with the conditional probability to see the final result. Uh, one thing not mentioned in the book uh, was what happens when you do this, which is that there is a concern of power and the use of power in a system of this kind, where people who are operating part of the system cannot know the resulting uh, aspects of the information they are feeding in. This is a distribution of power is issue, but it wasn't necessarily seen at the time as important because the problem of are the Soviets firing nuclear missiles was not one that really left a lot of room for questions of distribution of power. You know, what if, if, if you really, you know, cause problems in, you know, changing the way the system works to distribute power more equally, and the system was not optimal, then that degree that it is not optimal could allow a nuclear missile attack, and then everyone loses. And so it's, it's a, you know, bit of a, 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 a bad game to get into where 
you know, that this kind of problem can, can arise. So, but if you are dealing with a system like this in, for some other purpose than, you know, purely preventing nuclear war, that may be something worth thinking about uh, in, in that there is a trade-off between objectivity or, or at least the ability of a system using this to come up with accurate representations of things and the participants' uh, share and fairness of the results. Uh, kind of going further along this line, uh, it was thought that there would be someone, uh, some officer, in charge of any such system you would construct. And so this was a design factor. This is a consideration that led to consequences in design, such as the aforementioned distribution of power. Uh, if you start with the assumption that there is going to be only one person who needs to know the output of this you know, function or out output of this computer system, then it's not going to really bother you that the lower ranking officers can't see the data. Um, it is just you know, part of the design. And specifically, uh, another uh, feature of this uh, is that if there is an officer at the end of the processing of the data looking at the recommendation of the computer, uh, that if the computer recommends something crazy, at least there's a human being to say, hey, this is crazy, or you know, maybe we shouldn't push the red button. Uh, and in fact, the computer system was constructed and did come up with, at least once or twice, the recommendation that war was starting and that the nuclear uh, war or response should be conducted. And because of this con design consideration, a human being was at the other end and was able to say, no, actually, let's go over the data again. Uh, so the idea of putting a human being at the end of the recommendation was not actually a bad idea. And so, in, in general, the, the person at the end of this process or processing is just an intelligent object that then can make recommendations. And so the view of a system of, you know, a system that ma makes recommendations based on data is going to include him a as a component. And so I'm, I'm going to pass out another handout at this point. Uh, but I'm also going to try to give a little bit of a drawing on the board to give a, a view, a high-level view of how this is going to work in practice.
So this is basically how the high-level view of the system is going to work. There's going to be at the ground level uh, people entering in or entering in information into computer systems. Uh, there may be some cases where computer systems are going to have data come into them by other means. Uh, for example, the missile defense systems at the time are going to have radar attached to them. They're going to have uh, human beings in front of radar screens uh, entering, in, or entering in information from those particular screens. For example, which airplanes are where. Uh, they'll have information from the airlines that human beings are probably going to be looking at computer screens from airlines or maybe even paper from airlines uh, to, or, or even non-computer non electronics, you know, just basic TV monitor type things that are not hooked up to computers with human beings looking at screens, getting information from them, plugging it into a computer. Plugging it into a screen that, or a, a computer system that then has some kind of communications link to this NORAD system in question. And then in NORAD itself, uh, you know, at the computer center, you know, the room filled with computers and, and human beings looking at screens, there will be a screen for each data source. So for, you know, for example, missile defense will have one screen or maybe a couple of screens. Your telecommunication system will have another screen with information about it. Your, you know, this BM EWS system, War 38L system, all these are different kinds of systems with human beings on one end feeding information into them, communications channels, maybe over the phone line or whatever, maybe some kind of specialized channel, uh, pointing or with a, uh, on the other end of that, a human being looking at a terminal accessing that information. And then from there, those human beings are going to be interpreters for the system in question. They are going to be basically plotting in information, not necessarily making judgments about that information, but being as accurate as possible, moving information from a variety of different systems into the, the, the system in question. And so, you know, it, in the case of, say, you know, radar movements of planes, you know, there may be a human being looking at a radar screen, feeding in information about what objects are there and how they are moving into a system, and then that system is communicating with the, the main system, uh, and somebody at that main system, a human being, is going to be looking at a screen, copying information that's coming from that system and the people in that system into the current database, or the current, you know, the, the command and control system. And there's going to be another kind of layer of human beings, maybe on a different floor or what have you, that are going to be in charge of the conditional probabilities. The probability of, you know, your, you know, if you have a certain object in the sky, what is the probability that it is a nuclear missile? Or what is the probability that it is a plane? And what is the probability that the radar machine in question is just glitching? And you know, all sorts of hypothesis based on some fact. So if you see a glitch, or if you see something in the radar, what is the probability of? And so they are going to have available to them uh, displays of the data in question. Uh, but their, their main role is going to be to estimate the conditional probability. And so the, the I guess, priors of the system, the, 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 the current state is going to be fed in from the first set of people. The conditional probabilities are going to be fed in by the second group of people. And the resulting conclusions will be generated by some program running you know, iterations upon iterations of Bayes' rule on the data, given both the density of, you know, possible outcomes, etc., and it is going to come up with an answer, which is then going to be put on a display in front of some commanding officer. 
Now, the commanding officer is also going to be able to see the display from the conditional uh, group, or the, the estimators as well, but that is only really going to be useful to him in case, or as kind of a sanity check. He's going to be mostly guided by this kind of output of displays. Uh, the, the probability of the questions he wants to know are going to be displayed to him. And you know, they'll probably be displayed on you know, some computer screen, but there could also be reams of paper provided to him with reports as well. But the, the, the important point being that this output display does not get shown to these two groups of people. Uh, that this output is for the commanding officer alone. Now, it should be pointed out that this kind of view of a system, including the human beings involved, does not necessarily have to be used for, you know, a command and control structure for a, you know, military installation. This can also be used for other things. For, um, for example, uh, at a network operation center, at a telecom company, for example, you could use something very similar to this, and you, you can imagine that other company or that companies may end up actually have been doing this for the past 50 years. But the 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 question of you know, what do human beings do in a given system, and what do computers do? This separates that out, and so your, you know, the, that that is their approach. That is their idea that this particular design. Now, it's it's pointed out uh, that the use of information and kind of the 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 proper application of Bayesian inference kind of made something clear about the minimax principle, which, uh, quote, is so absurdly conservative and therefore often severely suboptimal that it does not deserve to have serious consideration as a basis for real life decisions, even in games against a hostile opponent, except under very unusual circumstances of a sort, not worth examining here. So th this is kind of telling them that the assumption of, you know, reducing your uh, opponent, uh, you know, uh, the maximum amount at every possible step, and then, you know, using that as a, you know, what can we do, you know, as a best action after that, um, even by this point, was seen as, you know, hopelessly uh, naive and hopelessly, um, you know, unfounded, and that you had to have some kind of a uh, a, a, a broader view that used the information you had in a more subtle way. And so, in order to make something like this work, uh, you need four pieces of information. The four, I guess, pieces of information that you need to collect are the actions and the list of actions that you're considering. And 
that this li list of actions is ordered by your preference for them, or at least ordered by the appropriateness of those, those particular actions. And so if your actions are limited to fire the missiles and not fire the missiles, that's a list of potential actions. But there's also going to be other things like send armed forces into some country, overthrow some other you know, dictator or, or democratically elected person, you know, all, all sorts of questions that they're going to be considering and all sorts of actions that they're going to be considering as well as a government of a large you know, Western nation. Then there's going to be the set of all possible states. Now, uh, going back a couple of videos, this is kind of smelling of uh, kind of computer omnipotence in that they are assuming that it is possible to collect all the possible states that a, 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 a game or a, a model of the world could be in. So this may be a little bit uh, unfounded on their side, but at the same time, uh, that is kind of what you need in order to make this sort of thing work. So it might be worth thinking about that. Uh, but in particular, this set of possible states has to be, uh, well, one, it has to be exhausted. So it has to be all the possible states that your system, your model of the world could, could be in, as well as mutually exclusive. So you have to split up the possible states of the world into uh, a fine enough granularity that your you know, states do not, you know, are not shared between your situations. So uh, three, uh, the payoff for each state. So this is going to basically be your preference for each state in terms of your, your costs, your lives lost, your you know, political power gained, uh, the, 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 the relevancy of each state to you, and then the probability of each state to start with, i.e. The, you know, the question of what are we actually in this state or not, and the, the likelihood they're in. So the expected value for an action J, so our J's are our actions in this case, is the probability of the, I guess, expected outcome or expected hypothesis of that state or of that action. So if, if for example, we, we have some data, from that data we're going to generate a, so, so we're, the D is going to be some reading from a computer screen, some, some data or information we're getting from a computer. And we want to know some state or some uh, possible outcome based on that data. So for example, if we're thinking in terms of radar screens, you know, the D is going to be the screen itself or, or some you know, object on that screen. And then the probability is of H is going to be a hypothesis about that data. So for example, is that a plane? And then is there going to be an action associated with if it is a plane? And then what is the expected value of that action? So the probability that it is a plane, given this radar information, and our action of that, weighted by the particular I for each possible hypothesis and action, I guess, um, combined. So you're, you're, you know, for each action and each hypothesis on that, 
there's going to be a weight or a value of, uh, assigned to it, a relative payoff uh, for that particular state and for that particular action given that state. So your, your expected value is going to be changed depending on how or what state you're in and how you act in that state and your prediction of the combination of those two based on this relationship. And so this, this you know, summing of all of these states is going to make it so that you're not dependent on your particular uh, action or your particular state given that. And so it is going to you know, continually give you a, a expected value of your situation. Now, another thing worth pointing out from this book is that there is a difference between the expected value of an action and the expected value of an action rule. And so, uh, in on page 180, in, quote, Mathematical Specification of Goals for Decision Problems by Roy Radner, uh, in Chapter 11, uh, they split the two, I guess, conceptions of value apart. And that there is a question here of how different kinds of systems uh, react to bad data. And specifically uh, in the transducer paper, uh, they're really only concerned with one outcome. So they're concerned with an outcome of, you know, are the, the nuclear missiles being fired? And so in that specific situation, the, the question of action or non-action doesn't really, um, you know, it's, it's not as an, an important one compared to uh, if we fail to predict that, uh, can we still recover enough for other purposes? And so in this particular example, it may be possible to uh, come up with an expected value of some action. which is you know, negative, or at least slightly more subtly related to your other goals than merely survival. But again, it, it's going to be, you know, this is going to be a expected value of an action, and so you're going to want to either commit to that action or action rule, or not commit to it, but this is going to provide a single number, basically, that expresses the value of that action and that you can use that to compare with other actions. And so this is going to be the, the function that gives your list of actions that you're considering uh, an order. It is going to well order your list of actions based on your conditional probability, the action you're, you're considering, and the combination of the state and the action together. Another uh, point here is the uh, in uh, on page 219 uh, in quote subjective programming unquote, uh, the point was made that these kinds of designs are going to make sense if your system includes risk and if your system includes the the possibility that bad predictions uh, have negative consequences. So this is going to be a wide general array of kinds of systems, but you're not necessarily going to always be, you're, you're not all systems you're going to design are going to have this, this property. Another point is that these probabilistic information processing systems uh, don't invent hypotheses. This each, this view of, of what state you are in uh, is not inherent to the, the system in question. A human being has to come up with it, or at least in the 1960s, a human being had to come up with it. And in particular, they were aware that human beings do not necessarily always come up with all of the states. They come up with states that you can then use this, this kind of summation to get values of and values out of, but you do not necessarily, as a human being, have an innate ability to always list all the potential states. 
today you could do a little bit better uh, in that there are ways of coming up with uh, alternative hypotheses. Uh, systems like, for example, Watson uh, will do conceivably better than human beings at this coming up of, with hy relevant hypotheses uh, aspect in some cases. And there's also the question of uh, kind of a general question, or the, the generality of the hypotheses in question. So for example, this H, this external hypothesis, may be uh, constrained to the domain at hand. So is it a military hypothesis? Do, do, do you, the human beings you're paying to come up with it, these ideas, do they have to all be military in nature, or can they be general suggestions in general? And i.e., you know, how tightly coupled do they have to be with the problem at hand? Uh, or can, you know, you be satisfied with a make this somebody else's problem uh, suggestion? Another quote worth making, uh, or, or relaying from the book, which is worthwhile here, is, quote, Still it would be sterile to study diagnosis without always keeping in mind that diagnosis, or diagnosis by itself is futile. It is worthwhile to figure out what is going on in the environment only if, at least under some circumstances, you contemplate doing something about it and need the diagnosis in order to, de to decide what to do. In other words, uh, all of these designs assume that you're going to be acting, and the only question is what action will you be taking? So if you do not assume that your system is going to be acting, then you don't need it, all this other stuff. So the open questions at the time that this paper was kind of put out uh, was one, uh, can can men be effective transducers of probability? I, can men sit down at a table and write down the conditional probability and have a accurate uh, chance of doing so? Uh, the, the, the question about whether women could do it was not asked, but it was interesting that they phrased it specifically in terms of men. Uh, this is a very gendered field uh, in the 1960s, so, and, and in particular due to the last video, we saw that a lot of the uh, you know, women nurses at the time were dealing with the same problems. And so you know, the question of whether one would do better than the other was not even just an open problem, but still had yet to really be asked. Uh, two, uh, whether uh, really badly constructed and su sufficiently inferior uh, machines, uh, whether their attempts at uh, translating probability estimates into conclusions, uh, whether that would work. Uh, that was kind of, kind of an open research question at the time. And the, the kind of uh, resulting answers that they were going to have were that um, the machines were pretty bad at uh, estimating probability, but they were better than the human beings already. Uh, another point, going back to the previous kind of picture, uh, is that especially uh, when dealing with non-conditional data, uh, human beings seem to prefer some probabilities to others. And so they would, they would wrap their mind around uh, whole numbers and whole number ratios uh, much more readily than uh, the you know, very fine-grained, um, seemingly random data that their computer systems were feeding into them. That they were willing to gamble on unlikely events, uh, even though they were not necessarily uh, fully cognizant of the odds in question. which led them to the conclusion that, quote, men should not be permitted to combine probabilities with payoffs in action selection, i.e. that people were so bad at this that it was unremediable. And going back uh, two videos, we, we see another example of where, given the evidence, human beings are just bad at coming to the correct conclusion, uh, at least in some cases, i.e specifically in this case, that men should not be given probabilities to play with to, to 
draw conclusions from. They should only be the source of probabilities. I.e., they should only be the source of conditional probabilities, but they should only be the source of information. That drawing conclusions and making judgments, even by 1964, even with the fallible computers they had, they knew enough to not put human beings in charge of making conclusions based on data. The job, the work of making conclusions based on data was already getting too difficult for human beings to do. And in particular, unconditional probabilities. That was just a disaster waiting to happen. So, quote, no one has even considered, much less studied in the laboratory, what are the best response mechanisms for probability estimation? I mean, what are the, the, the ways to estimate probability? E even limiting human beings to just coming up with estimates for probability and estimates for conditional probabilities, even that, by that point, they were starting to become skeptical that you could get information from a human being sufficient that it would be worth feeding into a computer. So, you know, th there's a lot of claims here in that, you know, yes, you can design a system that then pulls information from a variety of different places and then ties them together using Bayes' rule, but, you know, d one, does it actually work? Uh, two, is there reason for us to do things this way? And so what they ended up doing uh, was a, a set of experiments. Uh, to uh, basically compare and contrast the computer doing the inference part versus a human beings or a set of human beings doing the inference part as a way of comparing whether or not human beings should be trusted with this inference step. And the question of, you know, if you're designing a system, uh, and you want to, you know, ask where to put a human in and where to put what valuable information human beings have in. You know, the, this kind of perhaps a double blind test is going to be one way of approaching that question. Another quote from the book, book worthy of kind of relaying on, quote, the consequences of any particular decision are never fully realized but ramify indefinitely into the future. Uh, this is on uh, from one Robert or Roger N. Shepard on objectively or on subjectively optimum selection of, among uh, multi-attribute alternatives. So basically, the idea here is that going back to the feedback mechanism earlier, uh, if you have human beings, sooner or later they start to forget that a piece of information was given to them, and they start using. Uh, the information they have with the assumption that that really far distant past information was never given to them to start with, even though it is worth considering I mean, good data still. So you know, even after a hundred iterations of you know, Bayes' rule, you know, you still maintain the original information, but human beings after a hundred iterations of similar uh, multi-layered inference may not include So their experiment uh, specifically looked for mathematically inclined people who had not encountered Bayes' theorem. Um, they did find uh, enough of these subjects to, to conduct an experiment, uh, and they presented them, uh, or they, 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 they mentioned the possibility uh, that there may be feedback worthy of consideration to these people, but they didn't explicitly describe Bayes' theorem or anything like that. So that they, the, the author suggested here is that one of the things worth pointing out about this is that this means that their conclusions also suggest that the, the two layers of people should be ignorant of the Bayes' rule, and that the uh, potential objectivity of the system may require people uh, not actually know that. Looks like my computer is about to get battery.
battery again. So they so basically there the 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 question was left as an open question of whether or not the people involved uh, necessarily need to know how Bayesian inference works if they're part of it. But again, this goes back to the distribution of power question, so it might be worth thinking about. So they had 32 uh, ordered sequences and 32 random sequences of data. And so uh, they were basically trying to get uh, people to predict based on, or using Bayes' rule, uh, based on just kind of eyeballing the data. So I, also another historical note worth pointing out is that they were not actually using random numbers. Uh, they were using pseudo-random numbers, but their random number wasn't very good at the time. And there's good reasons to expect that their random numbers actually did have patterns in it. And so some of their conclusions may uh, actually be suspect on that grounds. But, so five things were tested. One, the amount of information that the human beings were given. Two, the distribution of information. Uh, three, the degree of con uh, convergence to some hypothesis. Uh, four, the order of pr or presentation of the information. So whether they were given data that actually led to a hypothesis, i.e. ordered data, or scrambled data that actually did not suggest any hypothesis. Uh, and I think that's only four. Ah. Obviously didn't know the fifth one now. Anyway, uh, so that they, they, they conducted this experiment where they basically gave human beings information on a radar screen and expected them to make predictions based on it. And so their results were, one, that there was no contest between the use of a Bayesian system and these human beings looking at this information, that the Bayesian system won on every single level. And it was even more remarkable than the, the experimenters uh, actually predicted at the time. So you know, th this is comparing human beings up to a potentially perfect standard the human beings didn't actually win. So, surprise, surprise. Two, uh, the the subjects were more willing to estimate and er, estimate an increase uh, in their probability for a diagnosis uh, favored by new evidence than to decrease the estimate based on uh, evidence that did not support their claim. I.e., when you are given information that supports an idea that you have you're likely to believe it. But when you're given information that does not support an idea that you have, you're not as likely to believe it. And so this kind of bias, this skewedness of our willingness to accept new information means that if a system were doing the inference part and doing that part equally for both inferences, or for both information that supports and does not support an idea, then it has an advantage over human beings on that ground alone. One subject in question became less sure the more evidence that was presented to him. So in other words, that even in cases where he was on the right track and was able to see uh, some hypothesis gaining credibility as the information was presenting itself to him, he became more and more confused about it. And so, in general, the third point is that human beings were tended to be, uh, even in the case where they were able to detect that there was some hypothesis that the data was leading to, that they tended to be more conservative than they could have been. I.e., that they, they, they saw the information, they figured that it wasn't as strong of evidence as they thought, and so they, they kind of expressed caution in their uh, their resulting hypothesis, or they, they express caution in coming up with an output uh, prediction from it. And I'll quote, the finding of conservatism in information processing
conforms to our intuition. We believe that typically men want to be sure than they should want to be, and so pay to obtain too much information. That generalization, combined with the rules of the game, is often enough to play winning poker, unquote, i.e., we as human beings want to be sure of ourselves, and we are willing to pay a cost to be sure of ourselves, and that this cost is not necessarily a rational cost. If we only reason correctly, we can often come out better than if we reason and then express uh, unsuredness at our reasoning, if our reasoning was correct in the first place. Another problem that human beings suffered is that the amount of information that we overshot, i.e. the amount of information that we claimed uh, we had when we didn't, uh, was proportional to how closely the uh, question was uh, proposed to uh, Bayes' rule, and how well the question was proposed uh, skews our perception of how sure we are uh, in relationship to it. So for really general, hazily defined questions, we may be actually more accurate because we are not uh, too sure of ourselves because of the question itself, whereas questions that are explicit uh, we may be too sure of ourselves. So this actually goes to the, you know, there's a lot of people who complain about word problems in math. And so, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I, I read this paragraph problem and I have trouble interpreting that particular problem in terms of some variables that have some relationship between them. And so there is a problem related to that by if the problem pr is presented to you in a clearer way, you are more likely to overexpress your confidence in your answer. And so the, the confusingness of the question itself actually gives human beings an advantage in that you're able to deal with that problem in a way that a, the same problem expressed clearer will confuse you. Another thing that human beings were in this experiment, uh, I guess, at, at a loss of was that the bigger the stakes, the more biased we tended to be. And so if rewards were given, people started screwing up more. And so they, they, there was a relationship between the, the stakes and the, the, the ability to screw up. And so going back to the purpose of this system, the purpose of this system is the biggest decision of the time, the biggest research problem of the age, the, youth, the very survivability of the species, the species itself, you know, this is a huge, very important problem, and so if we are screwing up, and if we are biased to screw up, the bigger the problem and the higher the stakes, then this has the highest stakes of all. So the, the argument is, we cannot be held accountable to this problem. We cannot reason properly about this problem or at least by that argument.
So one of the things that they come, came up with was this uh, metric for how well human beings were doing. So the p hat is a estimate of the probability that the humans came up with. And then this p is the estimate that the computer came up with. And so the, this you know, probability of hypothesis of i for data n minus the same probability that the computer comes up with squared for each hypothesis sum divided by the sum of 0.25 who knows why it was 0.25 uh, minus that same estimate squared. And so this is a kind of metric used to compare not even necessarily uh, the humans in question, but humans across, you know, different situations, like for example, given more information, how does this particular metric change? You know, given, you know, different sequences, how does this change, etc. And so a bad, you know, PI metric is about 100, and etc. And then a perfect performance is zero. And this in or specifically uh, doesn't uh, respond to movements in the priors or the posterior, i.e. the predictions themselves. It just responds to movements in the conditional probability fed in. And so th this was how, you know, given the experiment they were conducting, how they used the measure. Uh, another point worth making is by 1963 and 1964, this was all, like the, the, the idea of this high level design of this system was purely theoretical. They were looking at the question of how do you deal with this information in an optimal way, but nobody had ever tried doing this before. Today we are less, or it is less likely to be purely theoretical, but if you look around you in the systems that you use on a day to day level, know, even things like your, you know, the computer or your cell phone in question, how much of it actually uses Bayes' rule to predict things? How much could it use that same, you know, same model, the same idea? That is the question. So, the, the, the final conclusion from their experiment that they had is that it turned out based on this metric that human beings uh, didn't actually perform all that well even at producing these conditional probabilities. Like even, even at transducing between information the system had to start with and the information that was desired. This was not something that human beings did very well. However, at least as as far as the computers in 1963 were concerned, the, they weren't that bad enough to warrant replacing on that part of the Every other aspect of the system that human beings were replaced on, i.e. specifically an in inference and the use of human beings for inference, uh, there was a marked uh, set of data. There, there was, it was extremely clear that there, they weren't going to be able to do it properly. And that if you were designing a system to prevent uh, nuclear war, to detect nuclear war, that you could not trust human beings on that particular role. Whereas, at least in this particular role, there was some doubt that human beings would not be sufficient. That has been 10 ideas, 50 years. Uh, just as a kind of view at a glance, uh, and perhaps at a summary level, we've discussed a lot of things that kind of led to this video. You know, we discussed how psych nurses have trouble with interpreting data, which then fed into this question of, well, how do you deal with data in an intelligent way? 
and how do you design a, a system that deals with this data in an intelligent way. We discussed that the, I, the very idea of probability as a subjective thing, as something that is specifically definable to you, the person doing the analysis, or in this case, to the system in question, the command and control system that this view of probability allowed for greater accuracy given a mountain of data available to it so that the data didn't have to be thrown out. That the, the subjective probability of the data in itself could be valuable and when used with the Bayesian uh, method and with Bayesian inference, that it can actually uh, beat systems that are only fed with true information and accurate information. We discussed the possibility of generating uh, functions at random and how one would do that at an abstract level and how that actually had consequences in game theory and elsewhere. And that when those consequences are applied to systems that specifically are built with game theory and the solving of games in mind, that we can then use the data we have in a way that is kind of um, I guess useful to us. We've discussed the uh, availability of optimal solutions to game theory problems that happen when you apply subjective probability to them in such a way that you're able to guarantee uh, positive outcomes or the perception of positive outcomes to multiple actors and that this is something that you can design systems around. So the, these are all ideas that are not necessarily well known, and hopefully you are, are, have some value in your life to knowing about them. And uh, there, there's probably going to be a, you know, a Bitcoin address at the bottom of this video, wherever it is posted. Uh, it, this this is a, a free set of videos, but you're, you know, of course, uh, fully encouraged to uh, support this kind of thing in the future. Uh, and uh, so again, uh, if there's any inaccuracies in this entire series, feel free to point them out. Um, it is not necessarily uh, something that I should be, you know, telling and relaying to you. Although, you know, this particular book was a little bit difficult to track down. Hopefully, you find uh, value in knowing about it. So again, uh, this has been 10 Ideas 50 Years. Hope you enjoyed.